So we're going to be looking at Nozick's theory of distributive justice. Nozick was a professor at Harvard for his entire career. He was a colleague of John Rawls and developed his theory in part as an alternative to the Rawlsian picture. He wrote a variety of influential books. The first one, the one we're going to be discussing, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which won a National Book Award in 1974, but also Philosophical Explanations, The Nature of Rationality, and The Structure of the Objective World. He died tragically when he was really quite young. He was also strikingly handsome, as you'll see, made all other male philosophers feel inadequate. <laughs> anyway came up with a theory of distributive justice. I want to remind you what that is. It's really the question of how the goods and responsibilities of society ought to be distributed among its members. So it's a question not only of how the rewards that society generates ought to be distributed, but also how the tasks, how the responsibilities of society ought to be generated. Philosophers tend to focus much more on the first question than on the second, but it really is part of the same problem. Now, Nozick urges us from the very beginning to keep in mind that a lot of responsibilities and a lot of goods come attached to particular people. Let's say you have a child. Well, then it seems odd to say, oh, I've had this baby, now who should take care of it? Let's figure out how to assign the responsibilities here. It's your child. Or similarly, if you make something, let's say you go out into your backyard and you cut down part of a tree and you craft something out of wood, it seems odd to say then, well then, who gets the wooden sculpture that you've created? You made it, right? And so a lot of goods, a lot of responsibilities come attached to particular people just because of the way they're generated. Now, becomes a question then of looking at this in the context of who actually makes these goods, who undertakes these responsibilities, and so on. There are a number of kinds of theories that have been developed of distributive justice. Nozick, I think, presents a very helpful characterization of some of these and a classification. First of all, some theories are end result theories. They look at justice purely in terms of the resulting balance. The resulting balance of responsibilities, the resulting balance of goods in a society. They don't really care who does what or who has you know, what goods. It's just a question of, you might say, a structural judgment. You could just look at a graph and determine the degree of justice from this point of view. And so it's a question really of, yes, how things in society are generally distributed, the identity of particular people, who has what doesn't really matter, according to that kind of theory. A pattern theory is somewhat different. It says the justice of a distribution depends on its matching certain natural dimensions. So there's something you're trying to match in distributing goods or distributing responsibilities. You're just to the extent that you actually match that previously existing thing. So a pattern theory nicely fits into this kind of pattern, from each according to blank to each according to blank. The first, from each according to blank, is determining how to distribute the responsibilities. The responsibilities of society go to those according to blah, 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 and then the goods should be proportional to something else. And you can fill in those slots with a variety of other things. To make it a pattern theory, they have to be some natural dimension, i.e. something that isn't just the result of people's activity, but I don't know. Um, well, we'll see lots of examples of thinking about this and think of the various possibilities of filling in the blanks. So, in addition to having that categorization of theories, and Nozick will argue for a third kind of theory, a historical theory, it's also helpful to have some test cases in mind, some familiar sort of problems of distribution that we might think about. So, let's think about these particular cases. One is just a problem of poverty. Okay, that's one of the main test cases that people think about in connection with distributive justice. What should we say about poverty? The poor will always be with us, we've been assured, well, Yes, but there are conditions that are better or worse, that generate more poverty or less poverty, and so it becomes a question of what we really say about that in philosophical terms. A second one familiar to all of us is grading. I will be faced with a problem of distribution at the end of this course. I will have grades to distribute. To whom should I distribute them? Ha-ha! Well, I might have all sorts of different theories of that, and in fact, professors do tend to have different theories of that. Then think about a vegetable garden. I grow some vegetables, and actually, I don't grow vegetables in my backyard. I tried it once, only to find out right when I moved into my house. I thought, I will plant a garden. I own a house, I'll plant a garden. And so I did. And things grow, grew very, very well until like the first part of June when they all died. And then I dug a little deeper and realized that there was this much soil and then sheer limestone. <laughs> so like nothing grows in my yard. Uh, well, actually, now something grows. I decided to go the native plant route. And what is a native indigenous plant? It's basically what people call a weed. <laughs> so 
Everybody thinks my yard is a horrible mess, but at least something's growing there, right? <laughs> so I keep telling everybody, look, this is, this is good, this is Xeroscape. And they just say, yeah, this is awful. <laughs> In any case, there's also the, case, the, the test case of my most valuable possession. The one thing that my brother has told me that when I die, he wants will to him. And I have it for you here. <laughs> there it is. And if you can't see that well, it's this. Okay? It's an official ball from the 1979 World Series. Signed by Bowie Coon Commissioner. Okay, now. Well, think about those cases and think, well, what is fair in each of those cases? Do I justly own the baseball? What's a fair distribution of grades and so on? Well, we've seen there are different kinds. The end result theory says that the justice can be judged structurally, remember? The identity of people doesn't matter. So we have to look at large-scale facts about society to answer questions about just distributions. So what do people who are concerned with end result theories do? Well, they show you things like this, for example. This is a map of Chicago by income. So I think, if I remember correctly, the red areas are kind of middle class, the yellow ones are sort of poor, the blue ones are fairly affluent, and blah, blah, blah. And so people concerned with structural theories of justice look at things like this and say, how even is the distribution? Where are the poor people? Where are the wealthy people? And so forth. Or they look at charts like this that give you the distribution of annual household income in the United States. With the median being about here, the top 25% line being here, things tailing off until you get to over 250,000 and then it gets bigger and so on. Um, or they look at charts like this. This is a Gini index of inequality for families, and it shows you the historical pattern, shows you this in the United States declining, with, well, more or less, until when? About 1968, when you start seeing a significant increase. Or this kind of thing, where you do a similar measurement with the countries of the world and look at degrees of inequality within various societies, where here the bluish green is the most equality, and then the red is the most, and purple is the most inequality. Or here is that by a different measure. Or people just show you photographs like this of the wealthy in the background with the poor in the front. Here, sort of sharp contrast, this is a city in India. Or perhaps just concerned with levels of absolute poverty, such as a person like this, a poor beggar in India. Well, in any case, those are all the kinds of things that people focus on when they're having, in the back of their heads at least, if not in the front, an end result theory. They're just looking at degrees of inequality, at levels of poverty, and so on. A pattern theorist doesn't do that. A pattern theorist says, look, you've got to match something. And so what is that going to mean? Well, yeah, we're going to look for things to fit the pattern. So let's think quickly about some theories of justice we've talked about during this term. Rousseau, he says, tolerate neither rich men nor beggars. Why beggars don't have a stake in the social contract and the rich can manipulate the system to their own advantage. And so you've got to avoid extremes. You've got to limit inequality. What kind of theory is Rousseau presenting there? It's an end result theory, right? He's concerned that nobody be too wealthy, nobody be too poor. Who, is the, who are these wealthy people? Who are the poor? It doesn't matter. You just look at the overall distribution. Or we talked about Rawls' theory, where we have this general principle about equal basic liberties, but then also principles of justice that tell us <coughs> that inequalities have to be arranged to everyone's advantage. So he says, really, in the end, that comes down to the following. Maximize the welfare of the least advantage. Well, what kind of theory is that? Well, democratic welfare, yes, but in terms of end result theories or pattern theories, what, what kind of theory is that? End result theory, right. You're just looking at levels of poverty. Who are the least advantaged people in society? Choose the social arrangements that will produce a higher level for those at the bottom. Marx has this sort of theory, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. What kind of theory is that? That's a... Well, it's not exactly an end result theory, because I can't just look at the distribution of responsibilities and goods and determine whether it's just. I've got to see whether the responsibilities distribution matches abilities. And I've got to see where the distribution of, whether the distribution of goods matches needs. So I need something additional, right? So this is a pattern theory. He says there are certain natural things, natural dimensions, like abilities and needs, and those are relevant to determining the outcome. So a pattern theorist needs additional information beyond that that an end result theorist needs, you need something about something else that this is supposed to be matching. 
And, and by the way, a lot of the objections to Marx's theory come down to not how he fills in these things in particular, but the fact that he fills them in with different things. An alternative to that is Aristotle's theory. He says, look, justice is a matter of getting what you deserve, and so you ought to distribute goods and responsibilities according to merit. He fills in the blanks with the same thing, merit. So those who have the most political virtue, for example, have the greatest responsibilities to the community, but also deserve the positions of political power within the community. So responsibilities and goods go together for Aristotle. They come apart for Marx, and that's a fundamental feature of the Marxist view that, at least many people think, leads to all sorts of problems. Well, now, Aristotle doesn't just think in terms of one kind of merit. Goods have to be distributed according to merit of the relevant kind. So he asks the following question. Suppose we have a flute. Let's imagine that there is, I don't know, somebody gives this class a flute. That would be an odd thing to do, but suppose somebody does. Or so, let's say there's only one flute in all of Boston. Who should get that flute? <laughs> Good, the, the best flute player, right? The person who can actually play the flute the best. And so you might think, yes, who gets the flute? The best flute player. <laughs> That's Aristotle's example. If you want a real person, there's a friend of mine who plays the flute, Alex Koch. And so you might think, yeah, if Alex is the best flute player, Alex gets the flute. Well, there are all sorts of things like that. You're distributing guitars. Who gets the best guitars? The best guitar players. Anybody identify that guy? Some of my best friends in high school. No? Oh, well. That's Jack Sonny from Dire Straits, playing money for nothing. OK, or who gets the gold medals at the Olympics? The people who do the best, right? Do we say, well, let's look at the countries involved and let's try to maximize the, maximize the welfare of the least advantaged? What's a country that never wins anything at the Olympics? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. You fill in the blank for that country. Uh, you know, that. Okay. May, we should give them some medals because they haven't won any yet. No, we say, so the, in this case, it's the women's luge. The, whoever gets the gold medal should be the one who performs best in the women's luge competition. Or similarly here for the skating competition. Or who should get the Lombardi Trophy? The winner of the Super Bowl, right? The best team. Or who should win the Oscars? Well, the best actors and actresses, and so on. Now, there are lots of different theories then that we've looked at about how you should do these things. Two of those are end result theories. Two of those are pattern theories. And you could come up with many other variations on these themes once you see the pattern. So here's what we would ask. Take something like my possession of the baseball. Is it just? What question do I have to ask? According to Rousseau, well, does it make me rich? <laughs> no, right? My possession of the baseball does not suddenly allow me to manipulate the political process. I wish it were. Oh, baseball, let the next governor be. <laughs> but it doesn't work, OK? <laughs> that does not, nothing to let me manipulate the political process. Does it make me a beggar or make anyone else a beggar? No. Um, beyond that, does it promote the common good? Well. I don't know. That seems like a big and complicated question about whether my possession of baseball promotes the common good. According to Rawls, I have to say, well, does it make the least advantage worse off? I don't think so. Um, but that, again, is a kind of large-scale social question. Marx will say, well, do you need it? I don't need the baseball. But actually, nobody needs this baseball, right? Baseballs are kind of luxury items, especially if you're not a baseball player, and in particular, a historical artifact like this from the 1979 World Series, nobody really needs it. So it's hard to say how Marx's theory helps us here. Aristotle says, do I deserve it? Well, what would be the relevant kind of merit? <laughs> Baseball merit? Do I deserve it in those terms? Well, as we'll see, almost surely not. But, <laughs> but that's a question of how I got it. And so let's just skip ahead to some other test cases. Grading. How should I distribute grades at the end of the course? Hundreds for everybody. <laughs> Hundreds for everybody. Well, that's one possibility. <laughs> uh, actually, I knew a guy. There was a professor at my college who did that. He taught modern American poetry. And he just said it to everybody at the beginning, yeah, everybody gets an A. And so you know, you're supposed to do what you want to do because you love poetry, not because you're grubbing for a grade. Um, I never took that course. I thought, that's ridiculous, okay? I, I thought that was ridiculous. Uh, well, <laughs> ridiculous why? Because it seemed to me that it basically said, I'm not going to evaluate anything you're doing. And if I take a course on poetry, it's either because I want to learn something about poetry or because I want to become a better poet or something like that. Well, if you're not going to evaluate me, 
tell me when I'm doing well and when I'm doing badly. I sort of thought, how can I learn anything, right? That'll be one of those courses where everybody sits around and does poetry and they say, oh, here's my poem, man. War, destruction, boom! <laughs> like, and they get an A for that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be part of that. Okay, so what would Rousseau say? Well, tolerate neither rich men nor beggars. Okay, so who in here has a GPA that's putting them into academic probation? Oh, we mustn't allow any beggars, so I'll give you guys A's. Uh, how about those who have a 4 Oh, Oh, well, we don't want that. You, you people are kind of like the rich people, so I will give you bad grades so that we even out those GPAs. Um, maybe instead I should just say, well, no A's and no F's. I actually had a third grade teacher who thought nobody in my class is good enough to get an A. Still hate that teacher. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she was better than my second grade teacher who locked me in a closet for an hour. Uh, did I tell you that story? Yeah, I was doing that, you know, we were counting by tens and she was holding up packs of pencils at 10, 20, 30, and I was the only person in the class. She went like this at one point to trick us. I was the only person in the class who said 70. And so she locked me in a closet for an hour. <laughs> And I just, yeah, probably that's when I decided I would homeschool my own children. The thought didn't go through, but I think that's sort of what did it for me. Um, yeah, what would Rawls say? Well, maximize the welfare at the least advantage. Give the best grades to those who otherwise would have the worst GPAs, for example. What about Aristotle? He would say, give the A's to the people who deserve them, right? There's a relevant kind of merit here. Match that. Uh, Marx would say, who needs them? Occasionally, students will come to my office and say, you know, I, but I really need a higher grade. I really want to get into medical school. Or the worst example is my first year here, where in June, mind you, in June, long after grades for the spring term had been submitted, a student calls me up and says, Professor Bonnebeck, I, I, I really need an A in your course. It's like, but the course ended six weeks ago, <laughs> right? Um, and actually, you failed it. And he said, well, um, yeah, I, you know, I had a lot going on, but I've got this job in Houston, and it's my last requirement, so I really need to have a grade in your course, and I really could use it to be an A. And I said, so he said, what, what can I do? So my answer was, you can build a time machine. <laughs> Go back to January, actually, like, come to my class, <laughs> take the exams and stuff, and get an A. Um, he didn't like this answer. And so a few minutes later, the phone rang again, and it was his wife, okay? And she was like, I can't believe it. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I, I looked at the records and it was like, the last time he showed up in my class was like January 28th. Okay. <laughs> like, he never did anything. How could I give him anything other than an F? Oh, my the wrong lines are really wrong. Oh, <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> Most of us think that needs argument isn't very satisfying. What about the vegetable garden? Well, who should get the tomatoes grown in your backyard? Aristotle might say, well, you. You're the one who actually grew them, or at least those with the most tomato merit. But I guess growing them is some sign of tomato merit. Um, what would Marx say? Those who need the tomatoes. Uh, it might not be you at all. Uh, what would the others say? Well, whatever maximizes, maybe you should go down and give them to the poor, etc. Okay, so what about my baseball? Well, do I have the relevant kind of baseball merit? There's somebody from 1979 with baseball merit, Dave Parker. He was one of my heroes. Yeah, so now, do I have the relevant kind of baseball merit? Well, Nozick says, in the end, the important question is how I got the baseball. So here's this story. Game 5, 1979 World Series. My brother and I are in the front row, right by third base. His, it's a complicated story, but basically we had tickets um, to seats way up in the top level of the stadium, but it turned out that my brother's roommate at Carnegie Mellon uh, had an uncle who had these extra season, he had season tickets and he had these extra tickets, so we traded and swapped and, and so on, so we got these tickets. So we're sitting right down there, and in fact, you can see my brother there very plainly, I'm this guy next to him. Now, what happens? First inning, um, Mike Flanagan throws a pitch to Dave Parker. Dave Parker fouls it off, okay, and it's headed, at first I don't see where it's going, it's up there in the air somewhere, but everybody around us stands up and is going like this, and I realize, oh, it's coming to me, okay, <laughs> or it's coming over here, and Doug DeSensei, the Baltimore third baseman, is running toward the stands like this, right toward me, 
and I can't see the ball. I'm looking up there, I don't see it. So what do I do? I call it. <laughs> okay, now, luckily, this was like October 26th in Pittsburgh. Okay, it was cold, it was about 40 degrees. So I was wearing my father's old Korean War field jacket, which has big floppy pockets. And I had my hat no. stuffed in the pocket. No. So here's what happens. So I'm going like this. Everybody else is going like this. The ball falls right into my pocket. <laughs> so luckily I reach my hand down before a bunch of other people do. Hang on. It's like, hey, I got the ball. <laughs> now, there it, actually, there it actually is. You can see the sensei coming over. This is the ball actually hitting. My brother's going like this. I'm there. You can barely see me because I'm going like this. <laughs> but yes, I end up with the ball. And so now everybody's walking away, and I'm not gloating. My brother's saying, Where'd the ball go? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now. Actually, this sort of story is exactly what I have to tell if you want to ask the question whether I deserve, deserve the baseball and whether I hold it justly. You have to know how I got it. So Nozick says, look, justice isn't a matter of judging overall structural distributions of inequality or something like that, or levels of poverty. It's not a question of examining whether this matches some natural dimension, like needs or abilities or merit. It's a question of how I got the baseball. Did I steal it? Well, then I don't hold it justly. But did I actually get it in a just way? Well, then yes, even if it was a way that was rather ignoble and did not display any merit of any kind. Nevertheless, that doesn't matter. The justice of a distribution depends on how it came about. So, he says, look, that's how we do it. If I ask whether this is just, I say, well, how did it happen? How did it come about? I need to look at the history. So he says, look, if I'm trying to design a theory of distributive justice in general, here's what I have to do. I have to have a principle of acquisition. How do people acquire holdings justly from nature? Now, I didn't get this from nature, but there are acquisitions from nature. Maybe I walk through the woods and I find something and I pick it up. Or actually, today I was walking around campus and I found a pencil, so I picked up the pencil. Uh, that's not exactly an acquisition from nature, but close enough. That's actually how I get almost all my pencils. I never buy them, I just wander around campus and see them abandoned, I pick them up. I do that with cats, too, that's why I have 25 cats. <laughs> but with pencils, yeah, 25 pencils are easier to handle than 25 cats, let me tell you. So anyway, there are ways of acquiring holdings justly from nature. To spell this out in detail is actually really complicated. You have to talk about the possession of land, you have to talk about farming, you have to talk about mineral rights, oil and gas leasing and drilling and all of that. So this is a complicated question. There are lots of ways in which we acquire things from nature. And some of those might be just, some of them might be unjust. So really, there's not a simple philosophical theory of this. There's a huge, complicated body of law required to determine this. Then we have to have a principle of transfer, how I transfer holdings justly. If I own something justly, then I can give it to someone else. I can sell it to them, for example. I might buy something from someone else who holds it justly. All those are legitimate ways of obtaining something justly. But of course, what is it to sell something justly, to buy something justly, to give someone something justly, and so on? All of that is complicated. And again, there's a big body of law about those kinds of commercial transactions, about contracts, about estates, and wills, and all of that. So this is a very complicated matter, too. And then finally, <coughs> rectification. How I go about correcting earlier injustice. So he says, I can give you a sort of inductive definition of a just whole. It's interesting, Kripke's causal theory of names is basically a recursive theory of naming. And Nozick here is giving us a recursive theory of justice. So they're both inspired by computer science, really. That's the, the leading idea in the background, the idea of recursive or inductive definitions and processes. And they're both thinking of, well, naming in the one case and justice here in terms of that kind of recursive and inductive process. If you don't know what recursion is, then ignore what I've just said. But if you do, a light bulb should be going off. It's like, oh, cool. <laughs> okay, they're paying attention to these things and using this in a philosophical theory. So here's, as it were, the base case of the induction, the beginning of the recursion. Somebody who acquires a holding in accordance with the principle of justice in acquisition is entitled to it. If you've grown that tomato on your land, then it's your tomato. Okay, that would be an example of this kind of acquisition from nature. Or you own that piece of land, you drill on it, you find oil, you pump the oil, the oil is yours. Then there would be a principle of transfer that would say someone acquiring a holding in accordance with the principle of justice in transfer from someone holding justly is also entitled to it. 
Okay, and so that's going to govern how we buy things, how we sell things, how we give things, how we inherit things, all sorts of things like that. Now, if the world were perfect, if nothing ever went wrong, he said, we could really just stop there. And that would be it. You can either acquire something justly from nature, or you can acquire it from someone who holds it justly. However, things sometimes go wrong. There are accidents, there are injuries, there are harms. So, for example, that's my car that I drove for 20 years, and then some idiot pulled right in front of me as I was going through a green light. And boom, it was gone. Okay, but that was an injustice. There, something went wrong there. I, there was an injury to me and to my car. Or much worse, this is what happened to my daughter's car when the same thing happened. She was a student here driving near campus. Somebody went through a red light, and she got hit by a truck going for like 45 miles an hour. Right, the, right by the Irwin Center, corner of the Access Road and 19th Street, and okay. And that was the result. Um, she's alive, but it's kind of an amazing thing. The guy at the junkyard when I took her to see the car was like, wait, you, you drove that car? You lived? <laughs> it, was, it was kind of amazing. Anyway, sometimes things do go wrong, either accidentally or because somebody engages in some kind of wrongful activity. And so, well, we have to say how to set things right again. So there's going to have to be a principle of rectification. Talking about how someone who acquires a holding in accordance with a principle of justice in rectifica rectification is entitled to it. So how do we set things right again? This is going to include the entire law of torts, of injuries, of lawsuits, you know, where somebody sues some, somebody for something else, of liability. We're going to have to think in terms of accidents and compensation and uh, all sorts of workers' compensation, all of that. There's a huge body of law, again, that we'll have to specify the details of. But then the idea is no one is entitled to a holding except in one of those ways. That's how you get something justly. You get it justly from nature. Or you get it from someone else who holds it justly, or you're given it as compensation for some kind of injury or injustice um, or accident or something like that. That's it. Here's an equivalent definition. I hold something justly if and only if there's a chain of holdings back to an original acquisition from nature with no uncorrected injustices. So where do I get my shirt, for example? Well, maybe from a retailer. Where does the retailer get it? Maybe from a wholesaler. Where does that person get it? From a factory, let's say. They get the materials from which they made the shirt from a cloth maker. That person got the cotton to weave the cloth from a cotton farmer. That person got the cotton from nature by growing. And so if all of those are either okay, or at least any injustices within the chain have been corrected, then I own the shirt justly. Yeah, in this case, it was goodwill, <laughs> which has a surprising array of men's clothing for very reasonable prices. <laughs> it's not true for women. The women's clothes there are awful. But men, I guess, lots of men who are kind of affluent get fat, and they give really nice clothes away. Good women. Awesome. <laughs> How would you know, though? How would you know? How would you know that they never did an injustice? Ah, okay, brilliant. Yes. There are a number of things you can say in criticism of Nozick's theory, and I think one of the deepest is, look, this is tricky, right? And in a lot of cases, these chains go back a very long time. So, for one thing, how far back do I have to look? And secondly, how do I actually know? For example, was there an injustice in the production of this shirt? I don't know. What if somebody stole this shirt from somebody and then took it to Goodwill? How would I know that, right? I don't know who the person was who gave it to Goodwill or how I, I you know, so it's like, yeah, I can't trace this. Or the justice of the cotton farmer. I mean, is it really just that that person owns the field? What if they actually trick somebody else out of the cotton field in the first place? Ooh, well then maybe they don't actually own. And so if you think especially that our society has been filled with deep sources of injustice, such that lots and lots of chains, if you go back very far, are going to end up looking unjust, you're going to think, oh, wait a minute, actually the whole weight of this theory is going to be tossed onto the principle of rectification, and we're going to be asked to determine lots of things that we are in no position to determine. <coughs> Who actually grew the cotton that went into this shirt? I have no idea. I have no way of finding out. And so you might say, look, you have no way of knowing whether that chain of, of, chain of holdings actually satisfies this criterion or not. And you might say, look, that's most of the time the position we're in. So I think it's a very good objection to say, wait a minute, according to this theory, I almost never know whether my holdings are just. Now, if we look at the baseball, we can see an illustration of that. How did I get it? Well, before me, the last person to touch it was Mike Flanagan. And before that, Rick Dempsey, the Baltimore catcher. And before that, well, he was given the ball by umpire Jim McKean. And he got it from Major League Baseball. 
and baseball got it from Rawlings. They got it from their factory in Costa Rica, pictured here. <laughs> um, well, it was made of cork, rubber, wool, cotton, polyester, latex, leather. All of those ultimately came from nature. But now I say, aha, see, I own the thing justly because the way I got it. But now you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tell me about conditions in Costa Rica in that factory. And I say, oh, look, you can look inside the factory. See, people are happy and they're making these balls and Costa Rica is a just society and blah, 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 blah. You say, wait a minute, where'd they get the cotton? Where'd they get the polyester? How about the leather? Did they kill the animals justly, et cetera? And all of a sudden you can start thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is, this is really complicated. So partly our objection to Rawls, to Rousseau and people like that was, look, you're asking these large scale questions, you're gonna imply that almost nothing I, have, I can know to be just, but here it's gonna look really similar actually. Because I make all of this dependent on these historical chains, I may really have no way of knowing whether I hold this justly or not. Well, here's his general idea. A distribution is just if everyone's holdings under it are just. And that means a distribution is just if it results from another distribu just distribution by legitimate means. So here is his slogan. From each as they choose, to each as they are chosen. Okay? What makes things just, as this points out, and by the way, this looks like a pattern theory, but people's choices are not a natural dimension. So in fact, it's not a pattern theory. But his idea is this. Do I hold my job justly? Well, how did I get it? If I bribed somebody to get this job at the University of Texas, then the answer would be no. If I cheated in some way, then the answer would be no. But really, how did it happen that I got this job? Well, people pro freely chose to hire me. Okay, they, there was a position, they interviewed lots of people, they decided I was the person they wanted, and they chose to offer me that job, right? I chose to accept it. And so in the end, it comes down to people's free choices. And he's really saying, look, that's what makes a condition just or unjust. Is it the result of people's free choices, in which case it's just, or is it the result of coercion, of trickery, of deceit, of manipulation? Then it's unjust, okay? And so it's really people's choices that end up determining whether people hold things justly. Now, I suppose if you want to be serious about it, you could say, well, yeah, let's think more about the rules under which I got this baseball, right? Because it was hit into the stands, I was allowed to keep it. Now that's the general practice in baseball now. If something's hit into the stands, you get to keep it. But it wasn't always that way. Why did it change? Well, that would be relevant because if it turned out it changed because of, let's say, some sort of coercion, people put guns to owner's head and said, we want the baseballs, then you might say there's an injustice to that. Actually, does anybody know when the rule changed? Why people are allowed to keep baseballs that were hit into the stands? No. Um, Quick history lesson, relevant actually, since this is a historical theory. There's only one person who's ever died in a Major League Baseball game, and that was Ray Chapman, the Cleveland shortstop in 1920. Um, there was a sort of game that was dragging on into late afternoon. It was getting kind of dusky. It was an overcast day. Carl Mays was the pitcher for the Yankees. He was um, a notorious fastball pitcher who was also known to like to brush batters back. Um, in any case, he threw an inside pitch to Chapman. This was before batting helmets. The ball hit Chapman right in the temple. He didn't see it in time, and he fell over dead. Okay? Um, baseball changed the rules at that point. The ball that, he, that hit him was, was one that had been in play for a long time. It was a rather dirty ball. Um, you can see this was not in play for very long at all, but you can see where Parker hit it. Um, it's already kind of, you know, from less than one inning of play, it's messed up. If something's been in play for like six innings, seven innings, by then it was a dark ball, it was hard to see. And so people realized this is unsafe. So it led to a number of changes, and the main one was to keep replacing the baseball, so they were fresh baseballs. Um, it's by the way what ended the dead ball era. Nobody intentionally juiced up the baseballs to make the home run hitting of the 1920s possible. It was just that they were throwing new balls into play all the time instead of playing with the same ball for the whole game. In any case, that's really where it came from. So it was, in short, the result of people's free choices. It was not the result of coercion or manipulation or deceit or anything of that sort. Now, Nozick says this actually implies important things about social arrangements. Pick some distribution that would be just according to some other principle, an end result principle, for example, or a pattern theory like Marx's or Aristotle's, and then, his point is, even if all people's needs are met, for example, even if all conditions of that theory of justice are satisfied, 
people may transform that into some other distribution by engaging in free activity. His example concerns Will Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain realizes he's very good at basketball. He starts playing basketball. People pay money to Will Chamberlain to see him play basketball. We started out with a just, let's say, highly equal distribution. But after this, it turns out there's a great deal of inequality. All those people are a little poorer in monetary terms because they bought basketball tickets. And Chamberlain, let's say, gets rich. Is that fair? Now, here's the dilemma. Well, if you say yes, you've got a historical theory. Here's why it's just. Because you had a just distribution, and people then justly and freely chose to give some of their money to Chamberlain. Or, here's another alternative. You could say no. No, because now there's a high degree of inequality. However, that means your theory at some point has to limit freedom. And this is true even if your theory doesn't care about inequality, but just cares about levels of poverty. Maybe some people get addicted to basketball. They spend all their money on basketball games. Okay, and so they spend all their time doing this, they spend all their money, they're now poor because they've gone to so many basketball games. Uh, well, yeah, that's possible, but is that fair? You might say, hey, it's unfair that person's now poor and Chamberlain's rich, or you, but then you've got to do something to limit people's free choices, or you're going to say, well, yes, because it came about through people's free choices from a just distribution. So his point in the end is that only a historical theory respects people's freedom. End result in pattern theories, he says, require constant interference in people's lives. Here's a little graphic that's meant to illustrate that. So here's his slogan, finally, in the end. Socialist societies would have to forbid capitalist acts between consenting adults. And of course, that's just what, just what socialist societies do. They forbid capitalist acts among consenting adults. They require that certain kinds of transfers go a certain way. Or they impose taxes that change the shape of people's free choices. Or as in a lot of countries with socialized medicine, for example, they just make it illegal for anybody to see a doctor outside of the official process. And so, in various ways, as we'll see, socialist societies do have to end up interfering with people's liberty. Now let's take a look at the history of the 1970s. It's relevant to what we were talking about last time and also relevant to the circumstances in which Nozick developed this theory. The 60s were a time of great idealism, great hope, the 70s were a time of hard realities, and people's hopes crashing, you might say, against the rocks of reality. Let's start with the presidency of Richard Nixon, pictured there, or here, painted by Norman Rockwell, in a kind of down-home American way. He served as a congressman, then as President Eisenhower's vice president, ran for vice, actually, we know all this because we've studied Kripke, uh, lost to JFK, then again, ran eight years later, defeated Hubert Humphrey in a very close election, but was re-elected in a landslide in 1972. Well, what went on during Nixon's presidency? There was great progress, you might have thought, in the Vietnam War. He started withdrawing US <coughs> troops from Vietnam. In 1969, when he took office, there were over half a million soldiers, uh, American soldiers in Vietnam. Just a year later, there were only 334,000. Um, a year after that, the number had been cut in half. Then, in 1972, only to 24,000. In 1973, it was down to 50. Um, I'm grateful to Nixon for this because I had a very high draft number in 1972. And if he hadn't done that, I would have been in Vietnam. <laughs> but anyway, as it happened, the numbers went down so dramatically that the draft ended. <coughs> now, he nevertheless got into a great deal of political trouble. One editor said, there's got to be a bloodletting. We make, we've got to make sure nobody ever thinks of doing this again. Now, doing this, what? What was it that Nixon had done that made so many people hate him, and in particular, so many people in the press hate him? The Watergate scandal emerged if, at first in the 1972 election, um, occupied the headlines for about two years, finally led to Nixon's resignation in 1974. And the result of that was a loss of faith in leadership and a shift of power from the executive branch to Congress. But that returns us to the question, well, why? What were people so upset about? It really had nothing to do with what Nixon did in office. It had to do with his history. Now, what in Nixon's history would have made people hate his guts? I mean, Eisenhower was a popular president, being his vice president. That wasn't something that would make somebody unpopular or hated. Um, Well, no, I mean, he was getting us out of Vietnam, actually, and things were going well there by this time, so actually that wasn't most, something most people were upset about. Corruption. Just, you know, tax 
Checkers scandal. Oh, the Checkers scandal and all of that. Yeah, that. I mean, there was some of that, but I, I think that was sort of water along under the bridge. Um, was he involved in some sort of investigation? Yeah, exactly. It was the investigation of Alger Hiss and the activities of the House Un-American Activities Committee and all of that. Okay, so it's really his connection to the anti-communism of the early 1950s that made people hate him so much. In any case, there's the Watergate complex where <coughs> a burglary took place of Democratic National Headquarters in 1972. Uh, five people were arrested, and there are a number of questions that emerged almost immediately and really have never been answered. Why exactly did people break into the headquarters? What were they looking for? Who authorized it in particular? How up, high up the chain did any of this go? Um, and what did the president know and when? That became the big question at the time. What did the president know and when did he know it? Um, really, in a certain sense, we don't know the answers to those questions <laughs> even now, despite the fact that it turned out the president was recording everything that happened in the Oval Office, and in the end, those tapes were released. I remember reading those transcripts and being shocked at the, not at the immorality of what was going on, mostly at the utter of triviality of what was going on in the Oval Office. Like, really? The president's just worried about that? What a waste of time. Anyway, this led to Congress passing the War Powers Resolution, which basically demanded congressional approval for any military action. Um, every president since has declared it unconstitutional, but it's never actually been challenged in court, so it's not clear what the Supreme Court would say about it if it were challenged. In any case, almost every president shows respect for it before he's elected and then ignores it and says it's unconstitutional. Another dramatic event, 1973, the Arab-Israeli War, also known as the Yom Kippur War. Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack against Israel and pushed heavily into, very far into Israel before finally being turned back, mostly as a result of Israeli air power. Then there was an oil embargo that followed that by the OPEC countries um, that raised the price of oil dramatically, uh, really not only in the United States but throughout the world. Um, and that had tremendous economic impacts. Here is a graph of oil prices. You can see them. This is in constant $2,005 <coughs> per barrel. It was under $10 a barrel up until 1973. And you see the price skyrocket to $50 a barrel. So it jumped the price of oil by more than five times overnight. So it led to tremendous disruptions. A gallon of gas was 19 cents before this happened. I remember it well. Suddenly it was over a dollar, and we were all outraged. Um, now that doesn't sound so bad, except that, well, a dollar in 1973 was worth about five dollars now. So, actually, it's significant. In any case, it went down a little, and then there was another of these spikes due to another embargo in 1979. And since then, it's, well, been all over the place. Now, <coughs> there were serious economic effects, a slowdown throughout the U.S. and Europe, a transfer of wealth from the West to oil-producing countries, inflation, the Bretton Woods Agreement, where governor, governments abandoned the gold standard and decided to set up the current uh, floating currency exchange. A dollar in 1973 is worth about $5.10 today, so there's been very significant inflation. I, I hesitate to tell you what I paid in tuition, room, and board completely for an education at an elite private school in 1973. Um, it was about my tuition, room, and board all combined at one of the most expensive schools in the country was $3,000. What? <laughs> okay, so that was worth about 15000 today. But still, yeah, an education at Haverford, Swarthmore, Yale, Harvard, and all those places was about 15000 a year then. We thought that was very expensive. And that's in today's dollars. I mean, it was $3,000 in $1973. Okay, well, anyway, yeah, I'll skip that. Here's what's happened to the stock market over time, and you can see here, yeah, oh, actually, it's really hard to read that, isn't it? This is, gen you can see the 60s here, a sharp increase, and then this is the 70s. <laughs> Basically, just a flat period of things up and down, but really ultimately going nowhere. So the economy really just stalled for an entire decade. In 1974, Nixon, because of the Watergate scandal, resigned. Here is, he is surrounded by his family making the announcement, and there he is getting on board the helicopter to take him away from the White House. <laughs> <laughs> he could just never leave that campaign. <laughs> Gerald Ford then became president. Ford is the only president never to have been elected. 
as president or vice president. Um, no one ever voted for Gerald Ford. Well, they did later in 1976, but uh, at, by this point, they had not voted for him. He had been a congressman from Michigan for many years. Um, he was probably our most athletic president. He was somebody who had been a football star at the University of Michigan. Um, nevertheless, the press portrayed him as bumbling. Um, every time he bumped his head on a helicopter or something, they would write it up as if he was a doofus. Uh, <laughs> it was very strange. In any case, um, he had become vice president when Spiro Agnew, who had been uh, Nixon's vice president, resigned as the result of unrelated scandals. And right around the time he took over, Congress passed a budget act that transformed the way congressional budgeting was done. It basically took a lot of power that had been part of the executive branch, put it in Congress, removed the president's power to impound or rescind funds. And really, ever since, there have been federal deficits. Um, here is national debt per citizen, where you can see that, yeah, right around 1974, things had been flat. National debt wasn't really much of a problem. But then it starts growing, and it's kept on growing. Um, or here it is by various presidents. And you can see things were around 1%, basically just statistical noise, until Ford. And then, well, yeah. Um, it's gotten worse and worse over time, with the exception of Bill Clinton. So, yeah, there's, yeah, it's sort of, well, yeah. <laughs> but you notice the trend. I mean, more alarming than any individual here is just the overall trend, which suggests the whole federal system is out of control. Now, there was another severe consequence. Congress halted the bombing of North Vietnam and banned American military involvement of any kind in Southeast Asia. They cut funds to South Vietnam, and once the Democrats took Congress in 1974, they cut funding off completely. The result was that the South Vietnamese Army all of a sudden couldn't even run their jeeps, couldn't run their tanks. They had no money. And so, not very long after that, Saigon fell. April 1975, a war that people thought had been won was suddenly lost. Here are people getting onto the last <laughs> helicopter out of Saigon. You see the scramble as people realize their lives depend on getting out. After the fall, millions of people were sent to re-education camps where they were tortured, deprived of food and medical care. Some stayed in these camps for as long as 17 years. Um, hundreds of thousands died. In addition to that, hundreds of thousands died trying to leave Vietnam. They became known as the boat people people who got into boats and tried to get to Thailand, or to Indonesia, or Malaysia, or anywhere they could get, uh, over shark and pirate infested waters to try to escape. Well, was the whole war a failure? In some sense, yes. On the other hand, it was motivated in part by the domino theory, and indeed Laos and Cambodia fell, but a variety of countries did remain free despite communist threats in all of those countries.